welcome to the Unlocking Archaeology series. Our channel aims to highlight the amazing variety of skills and interdisciplinary avenues of research related to heritage studies, archaeology, and paleontology in Southern Africa. My name is Mpomi Maringa, and I'm the chairperson of the Southern African Archaeology Student Council. I am joined by my fellow uh, council members. We have Sebastian Bolderman, he's the secretary. Um, as well as Tatenda Tavingay, who is the SADC representative, and also Nithya Eswaran, who's a social media and marketing manager. And we're also joined by our special guest for this episode, who will be talking about rock art in Southern Africa. And our host, Nithya, will be doing the honors of introducing our spectacular guest. But before we do that, I'd just like to, com I'd like to encourage you guys to comment and subscribe to our channel. And also remember to click the notification bell so that you can receive a notification when we have uploaded new content. We welcome all your questions and thoughts and points for discussion, and you can post those in the comments, the comment section, uh, section below. And if you would like to reach out to the Student Council or become a member of the Student Society, please feel free to contact us via email or on our social media platforms. And you can find that all in the description box below. Now that I'm done with my little speech, over to you, Nithya. Thanks, Pumi. That was a lovely introduction. I'd like to begin by introducing Dr. Adelphine Bono. Um, Dr. Adelphine Bono received a master's degree in archaeological sciences from the Université Bordeaux, Montaigne, France, and a PhD in atmospheric and earth sciences from the University of Quebec in Montreal, Canada. After a postdoctoral fellowship at Université Laval, Canada, she received the prestigious Banting Grant to pursue her postdoctoral research at the University of Oxford, United Kingdom. Since 2021, she is an assistant professor at the Department of Chemistry and History at the Université de Sherbrooke, Canada. She is specialized in archaeological sciences and dating methods applied in, to rock art paintings. She for she sorry, her her research focuses on the understanding of the chain operator and the dating of rock art in Southern Africa and in the Canadian Shield, along with investigating rock art and its link with material culture. The talk will summarize the discoveries and methods methods development accomplished in the past ten years, including maps of the use of paint recipes through the time in the Metolong catchment Lesotho and a discussion on the chronology of creation of two sites in the Meklia district, Eastern Cape, South Africa. Um, over to you, Adelphine. Thank you, Natia, for this very nice introduction. Um, so thank you, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to present my um, um, my results uh, and all the research that I've been done for about 11 years now with uh, David Pearson, the team at the Rocket Research Institute uh, in the Witwatersrand. So I will start by sharing my screen. And there we go. So um, today I uh, would like to talk about some rock paintings and uh, their paint recipe and some of the chronology uh, of the sites. Um, as you might know, it has been um, uh, the chronology of the sites of San Rock Art uh, has been really, really a big debate uh, for quite a while. And uh, until um, our first um, our first project that we started in uh, 2011, um, we only get a handful of um, of dates. But now, after this project, we are we have now 41 dates on uh, different figures uh, in Lesotho, South Africa, and uh, and Botswana. So today, I would like to just give you some overview of what we did and some implication of uh, those discovery. So going uh, back, so I, I would just start to just give you a very quick overview of uh, San Rockart. So um, you have San Rockart in pretty much all over uh, Southern Africa and uh, the what one of their um, 
main characteristic is that you have a lot of color and polychrome um, um, sorry, polychrome figures, as you can see here, especially polychromes elements uh, here. And as you can see, they use different uh, coloring materials and giving this uh, very realistic um, impression of the figures. You have mostly red, pink, orange, uh, yellow, black, and white color, but you have also some small pinkish, uh, pinkish sorry, uh, color like that. So we investigate um, all of those um, recipes and, um, and we try to relate them to some uh, local sources of uh, geological materials. So when we start, uh, when we started the project, um, it was in yeah in 2011. That was quite a while ago. Um, what uh, what we started to do was okay. What do we need to know uh, on those painting? And the first question that uh, arise was um, how were the paint made, but we don't want to know what gives the color of the pigments. We want to know what is the actual material that has been used. So, for example, the uh, some of the previous um, analysis or studies that has been done on sun rock art was that, OK, the red uh, color is given by hematite. OK, hematite is um, iron oxide, but this iron oxide can be found in a lot, a lot of different materials. So for example, in ochre, which are mostly a clay with iron oxide in it, but you can also find it in uh, sedimentary rocks as shale or sandstone or something like that. But you can also find big hematite like crystals of hematite that you can crush and then use as painting so when you say hematite has been used which form was in which form was this hematite so that was the main question that uh, david pierce has at this time and i was okay so we need to find a way to distinguish between all of those if i find hematite actually so that was the the beginning of uh, this first research of the objective and as i mentioned previously um most of the paint were not dated so there um, the main question was also okay how old are those paintings is it possible to know how old they are and is it possible to know for how long a site has been used um and has been created like is everything all the um all the superposition that we can see here for example where they dub in one time or where they don't over a very very long time so all of this uh that was a lot a lot of objectives and big ones because um we needed to um develop new protocols and find ways uh, to answer those questions and that has not been done before uh, for that we uh, in fact we had uh, the chance uh, to have the opportunity to get large sample uh, from two areas the tuny dam here and the metalong dam here uh, because sites were completely flooded by the construction of dams and so um, the um, we were able to get larger samples that we should have that we should have. And so we were able to develop uh, specific protocols and then we were able to apply them uh, in the instant cape uh, around the um, around MacLear. And then here we did all the protocol with very, very small uh, samples. So I will show you it now. So first, if we um, if we start with the first objective, which is paint, uh, how the paint were made. For this, as I mentioned, uh, we had to develop some specific protocols. The first thing uh, was, OK, can we come with portable instruments and get the answer we want? Um, actually, it was not possible 
for several uh, reasons. First, uh, we we didn't have the portable instruments uh, in Southern Africa, and it was uh, not possible to bring them uh, from France or from UK or from Canada uh, to South Africa, especially because of the cost of the insurance. And so we uh, we decided to find another way and to sample uh, the paint. So as I mentioned, on some sites we were able to get big sample and with that we developed a protocol to be able to get all the information we need on a very, very small sample. So at the um, after about one year of the project, rather than taking about uh, uh, about one centimeter square, uh, we took only this. So this is about the, the size of a head of a needle. And this is what we took after. And then we do all the characterization and all the information that we need on the paint. We do it only on this very, very small sample. And as you can see, sometimes it's quite tricky to sample. Uh, this is the later and I'm on top of it to sample some, some of the paint. Um, so what we did is um, we developed a very, um, a very detailed protocol with different um, instruments from analytical chemistry, but all you need to know, uh, because I don't want to go very, very intensively in it, is that we were able to do all of this type of analysis uh, with only a very, very small sample, uh, which is the, the size of a needle head. So that is very important because the damage on the painting is very, very small and it's very, it's barely visible. And um, all of this um, on all of this analysis, um, let us um, give us, sorry, the information of all uh, the stratigraphy of the paint. Because if you look at the paint, in fact, you don't have only the layer of paint. You have a lot of other, other layers all around the paint. So <clears throat> we were able to characterize these different layers as, um, as you have the stratigraphy on the sites, on an archaeological site, you have a stratigraphy of the paint, exactly the same thing. So you can see that if you go really from the surface, so what we see us, first of all, we have a, a weathering layer, which is a natural alteration of the paint and of the rock. Then you have the paint layer. Then you have another alteration layer, which is again the natural alteration of the, the rock before the paint was actually created. And then you have the rock itself uh, with different layers, which are uh, uh, due to the geology, <coughs> sorry, the geology, the geology, sorry, of the site. And all of this. Um, all of this information are crucial because we don't focus only on the paint. We focus also on, uh, we have a look of uh, all is present around the sample. And with that, we are able to distinguish between what's come from the rock and what's come from the paint. And with that, we were able to identify exactly what is in the pigments. And here are um, all the results and all the type of coloring materials that were identified uh, on sun paintings in both Botswana, Lesotho and Southern Africa. So as you can see, it's uh, quite um, diverse. Uh, you have three different uh, coloring materials for the black. Uh, you have four big um, groups for the white, but uh, the, this part is white clay and inside of this white clay you have several, uh, you have different clays that been used that we were able to identify, especially pyrophyllite, um, which is extremely interesting because it has been found only on three paintings in Lesotho. And uh, this one uh, is definitely not local. Uh, the closest um, geological source for pyrophyllite is uh, in the Northern Cape, and uh, it's about 500 kilometers far from the sites where we found uh, the use of this uh, of this clay. So it will be 
part of uh, another discussion sometimes <laughs> if I come back. <laughs> and uh, regarding the red, as I mentioned previously, we found, um, you know, pure hematite. So the uh, the mineralogy, uh, sorry, the mineral crushed. Uh, we found also ochre that uh, are, as I mentioned, um, uh, iron or clays with iron oxide in it, and also magnetite, which is another type of uh, iron oxide, which gives more a kind of brownish color rather than a pure red color. Um, what we uh, what we try to do is going a bit further than only saying okay ochre was used but trying to find where they come from or if we can um, exactly if we can relate also uh, with some testimony especially uh, mapote testimony who mentioned that um, the uh, the ochre that they use uh, for uh, red color comes from uh, the basaltic part of the Drakensberg. So uh, what we can do is trying to uh, go a bit deeper in the ochre and uh, see what is the geological information that uh, that are part of this ochre. And one of uh, one of the first thing to look at is if you have clays, uh, you have different type of clays. And in the in the paints that uh, we analyzed, uh, we found that um, we had two type of clays. One is kaolinite, and another is helit momorionite. So the only thing that maybe that would be interesting for you is that we have two type of clay, meaning that they come from two geological source, two distinguished geological source with distinguished uh, geological history. And from that, we can go a bit deeper and looking at what we call the structure of the hematite, so the structure of the iron oxide. Now, this can be done with uh, Raman spectroscopy. And what, uh, what you can see is that the peaks of hematite, so the one uh, with the H here, um, are not at the same place and uh, don't have the same size depending on the structure of the hematite. And this information is also linked to the geological history of the clay, of the ochre. So if we combine those information, we can see that uh, for the different uh, ochre that uh, that we sampled, especially in Lizutu and in Maclear, because no uh, red uh, red paints were sampled, uh, uh, not were sampled, but were studied in Botswana. Um, we can distinguish three different uh, that we have here, three different sources. We tried to go a bit uh, deeper, but um, it seems that uh, we were not able to get really reliable results to uh, try to go uh, on sub part uh, of big region uh, of big geological uh, sources. So we stick with those three different recipes. And what we found is that on on scenes, on uh, on rock paintings, uh, sometimes those red figures were uh, were seems to be together as part of a scene. So, for example, here the human figure are together; they are interacting uh, as what we call a scene. And in that case, it was the same uh, recipe that uh, that was used for the entire scene. So, in that case, we assume that. The paint, uh, this the scene was made as one time, but we were not able to give a proper date for now. But at least uh, for all the scene that we looked at, it was consistent uh, between the scene. Another thing was that we um, we tried to relate those geological feather with uh, geological sources that we found in Lesotho and uh, in Southern Africa. Uh, we went also in the basaltic part of the Drakensberg and collect some samples, uh, but the analyses are still ongoing, so I won't present them uh, today. But uh, we, as I can say, is that we started to find very good link between some uh, ochre uh, 
some with one type of ochre and this basaltic part of the Drakensberg, but I won't say more for now. Uh, but what is, uh, as I mentioned, interesting is that uh, one type of ochre uh, doesn't really match the local, very local one. So the geological sources that you can find close to, to the site, uh, but uh, they match, uh, one match, as I mentioned, something else that we think to be the basaltic part of the Drakensberg. But for the, the two other types, uh, they really match those type of uh, 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 local sources that you can find very close to the site, so like a, f a few kilometers from far from the site. So what we did with those uh, red ochre, we tried to do it also with the carbon black. Um, carbon blacks are um, incomplete combustion of something organic. So sometimes I mention uh, when you are um, cooking some uh, meat on a on a fry pan, for example, you will have a kind of a black residue on the back of your pan, uh, on uh, sorry, inside of your pan, and this is carbon black. So um, the thing is, you can do carbon black with pretty much everything, with oil, with eggs, um, with uh, blood, <laughs> uh, with grease, with fat, etc. So we try to find a way to distinguish uh, between all of those form uh, of carbon black um, what we started to do is just having a look at their morphology um, but we were able to find three different morphology that's uh, that was the beginning then we tried to have a look at the structure of uh, those carbon blacks but it didn't work that well i have to admit um so now we are trying to investigate uh, a bit further and making more uh, reference samples and trying to understand also what type of temperature needs needs to be reached to create uh, a good carbon black and what we discovered recently is that uh, we need to at least uh, reach the temperature of 500 degrees to be able to get a good carbon black usable to do a paint, uh, whatever uh, you use, some oil, uh, animal fat, eggs, or even blood. So that was uh, quite interesting, but uh, for now, Again, the only way to distinguish between those uh, different uh, materials that were burnt is only uh, by uh, optical, uh, as you can see here, optical observation. So here it's um, you have pictures that were done with very, very powerful microscope, which is called scanning electron microscopy, and that uh, uh, help um, Sorry, that make that make it possible uh, to um, to investigate uh, very the the very small structure of uh, the um, of a material. Uh, we can zoom on particles as 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 small as one micrometer. So, which is not possible to do with a conventional microscope. And again, uh, when we when we came back to the scene, what we discover is that those carbon black uh, and also uh, uh, soot and charcoal, um, when figures are together on a sign on a scene, sorry, um, they are usually they are made of the same recipe, so with the the same texture. So again, we can be more or less sure that uh, this will be um, the the sorry, the scene was done at us at sorry at one time. So as I mentioned with the carbon blacks, uh, we have uh, carbon on some of the paintings. So that was uh, a good discovery for us because we were like, great, we will be able to apply radiocarbon dating as, as, had, as it has been done uh, on previous uh, rock art around the world and, for example, on uh, European caves. So that was a good, uh, a very good uh, information. But on the other hand, um, on the other hand, when we come back uh, to all the information that we had on the paint, uh, we discovered that 
carbon is not present only in pigments, but it's present everywhere in calcium oxalate, um, in the different, so calcium oxalate have different form, which is wewelite and wedelite, which are part of the pigments too. Uh, we find it also on the weathering layer, and we have also some carbon from the rock. And um, if you want to date the paint, if you want to have a date on the paint, you need to remove all of this other source of carbon because if they are mixed together, your date won't mean anything. So we needed to find a way to just remove all of that and to be sure to remove all of those contamination before doing the paint. So for that, um, we came back to the protocol and we uh, tried to really well understand which uh, where those uh, pollution uh, for radiocarbon dating were present and also to try to uh, quantify as much as possible the proportion of uh, those pollution. With that, uh, we uh, adapt what we call um, a chemical pretreatment for radiocarbon dating, which use uh, acid and base to remove all of those contamination prior to dating. With all of this in on hands, uh, we were able to say, OK, if we want to get a date on this painting, we will need to collect this type uh, this size of sample. So all of this, um, all of this information comes from the very, very small sample, the head of the needle that we collected first. We were able to get the information on the on the paint, what type of coloring materials, and what are all the surrounding um, all the, the, the surrounding components from the rock and the weathering layers, which one are contamination uh, for, um, and sorry, which one are pollution for radiocarbon dating and how much we need to sample if we want to get a date for radiocarbon dating. So all of this is done with the head of the needle, but once we say, okay, we want a date on this figure, we need to come back to the site and we need to sample another uh, we need to collect another sample and this sample is about two centimeters square so it depends sometimes it can be only one centimeter square but most of the time it's about two centimeters square but it's pretty small and what we usually do is that we extend uh, already present holes inside of the figure and for sure we don't sample very small figures we focus on the larger ones and um, also what we did and that uh, what and what has not been done before is that before doing the date, uh, you know, we have the sample and then usually we do uh, the chemical pretreatment that we usually do for radiocarbon dating and then we send it for dating. That's what we do. We just say, OK, we hope that we remove all the contamination. But with our project, we decided to add a step to check that we will, that we actually dissolved everything that we previously identify in the paint. And with that, we were sure that we will date only the paint and only what is relevant for us. So this step is uh, using what we call a micro infrared uh, analysis. If you want any more details about that, uh, you can email me. <laughs> or you can ask questions at the end if you want, sorry. <laughs> so with um, all of this, um, with, um, with this protocol, we were able to get 41 dates on 35 figures. So that means that some figures were dated twice uh, with uh, a, a quite good um, um, reproduction uh, between the dates. So it means that our protocol works and that our dates are reliable, which is uh, very important for the interpretation of those uh, figures. And uh, what we did and what we were able to do is that on some sites, 
uh, we were able to uh, have a look at the chronology of the creation of the site. So this site uh, is in uh, the MacLeod district uh, in Eastern Cape. It's uh, R-S-A-T-Y-N. N2, sorry, it's a very nice name, a very nice name for, for a site. So for two panels uh, in this site, uh, we were able to get dates uh, from uh, three um, uh, three superposition that were identified uh, by David Pearson and his team. And uh, this gave us uh, another um, an idea of the time that this site uh, were made. So what we have is that five layers of superposition were identified. On those five layers, only the three in the middle were dated. So we know that the three layers, not the first one and not the end one, but the one from the middle were made between 2800 uh, BP to 1500 BP. So it's a very, very long time. So it, it means that the site has been uh, created for over 1000 years at least, and maybe more. So you can imagine that it's very important to know that people came back for that much time uh, in the same sites and had their um, their information, their their uh, their figures on the site. The other thing that we were able to do is uh, to put the different recipes that we identify uh, with those uh, phases, and that is what you, what is sorry very interesting is that the same uh, recipe for carbon black, so the same sub recipes of carbon black uh, were used over a different time. So this also um, is interesting because it means that they share the same recipe for quite a while. And to finish, um, the in the Metolan catchment, so in Lesotho, uh, in this valley which is now flooded by a dam, uh, a, a bit more than uh, 20 sites were entirely sampled and uh, characterized and date. And with that, uh, we were we were able uh, to see the um, the evolution of uh, the paint recipe over time, which is uh, interesting. Is that most of the most of the painting are, are not are not older than uh, three thousand uh, years old, but maybe maybe a bit more. But the dates are a bit. Uh, I'm not completely reliable for the two dates that we had before, so I, I didn't mention them here. But what we see is that um, at the beginning um, for the black paint, in, uh, they use mostly soot and charcoal. And then if we go through time, so between 3000 and 2000, only soot was used. And then uh, between 2000 and 1000, we have the use of both uh, charcoal and carbon blacks. And then for the most recent part, soot is not used anymore, but a lot of different carbon blacks are used and charcoal is used too uh, for the most recent part. So mostly um, the, the contact period and the colonial period. So this is, um, just to first, uh, it, is, it is just the beginning because for sure we don't have that many samples and we don't have that, that many dates. Uh, but you can see that we start to have information and some insight into the evolution of, uh, of the use of coloring materials over time on a, a single, um, in a single area. And we hope that we will be able to extend that uh, much more to other valley and other uh, places in, uh, in Southern Africa. So just as a conclusion, um, I hope that uh, I uh, that you have discovered that uh, with all um, with the characterization of the painting that we did, um, we saw that the sound people use a very wide diversity of coloring materials and that most of them um, were local in provenance. But uh, we identify recently, as I mentioned, the parophyllite, which is actually a quite um, 
which is coming for quite uh, um, for quite far from the site in Mesutu, and maybe more of them uh, come from far away from the sites, but uh, this needs much more uh, investigation. And again, uh, with all our projects, we started uh, to understand the chronology of the sites and of the figure. And so now it's the, with all of those dates, uh, it's a starting point for the interpretation of the art, the evolution of styles, and so on and so on. So to finish, this project involved uh, the collection of more than 300 uh, paint samples. Or, or from all of them, uh, only, I would say only, <laughs> but a bit more than half of them uh, were completely analyzed, as, as I mentioned. But also what you need uh, to know is that we didn't analyze only the paint, but also all the rock around to be able and to very well understand the rock and be able to distinguish between what comes from the paint and what comes from uh, the rock that make us uh, able to say, OK, this uh, this paint, this coloring materials come from uh, comes from sorry, um, comes from a uh, a, a local part uh, around the site or uh, if it comes from uh, far away. So thank you very much to everyone for listening. And if you have any question, I will be pleased to answer them. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Anna, for a very informative presentation. I'm still processing all of the information. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Meanwhile, if we have any questions, um, you can ask. Hi, Adolphine. If I can just ask first. Um, it's, it's more so with the, the last part of your presentation, talking about those 20 sites that you're saying in Lesotho, right? So, if, if I have it correctly, you said that you dated um, the paintings in those sites. Yes. Okay. And do you have any of the paintings that like um, that were like close in age, or is it those ones that are just grouped here? Oops. So like, do you know when? Like, were they painted around the same time? Is what I'm like trying to ask. Do you have any of the sites? Do you know of any of the sites that were painted at the around around about the same time? So, as I mentioned, you have, um, in fact, you you have. Uh, I came back to. You, you can see my. Yeah, mm. you can see my screen. That's funny. Um, so, in fact, you have um, all all of the sites that are mentioned in one square. Uh, are sites that were painted at the same time um, for a period of 1000 years. Um, so that is uh, that is interesting because you can see that some some sites are were, paid, were painted for quite a lot of time. So for example, the 252 uh, was painted for at least 1000 years, maybe more. And mm -hmm. uh, some others uh, were painted really uh, more recently, so those ones here. And um, not all the sites, uh, not all the 25 sites uh, were uh, dated uh, because not all of them had uh, black painting, black painting, sorry. Um, but um, uh, all of all of those that were dated are here. So we dated, um, uh, sorry, uh, about, <laughs> How much is it? Uh, we, we dated seven uh, sites exactly out of the, the, the 25 that, uh, that are present okay. in this valley. Um, and unfortunately, what is uh, interesting to mention is that um, the, there, there was a lot of archaeological excavation done by Peter Mitchell and uh, Charlie Arthur in this, uh, in this region. But most of the excavation gave uh, information about uh, Middle Stone Age occupation and very few on those uh, later Stone Age occupation. So actually the rock art and the dates that we had uh, make it, makes it possible to, uh, to know that 
um, uh, sorry, that uh, some people were present in this region, uh, later Stone Age people were present in this region uh, during that time. And, uh, and in fact, they didn't leave any, uh, or they, did, they didn't leave that much, uh, um, sorry, that much, uh, sorry, uh, traces, archaeological traces during that time. Sorry, <laughs> thank you. Okay, and then if I can just ask one more question. Um, you did say that um, in some sites you'd notice the patterns of carbon black being the most consistent um, medium for the for color painting for the black paintings that they that they made. Um, is there is there a hypothesis or something uh, as to why they they did not use like charcoal or soot at these sites, or is it still under investigation? So well, it is still under investigation, but uh, when I when I started, when I tried to make them, um, what is interesting is that uh, to make suit and to collect suit is pretty difficult. So you need to have the fire and you need to put um, a rock or something on the top or you need to be close to, uh, you need to set your fire close to a rock and then you will scrub the rock to get, um, to get the suit. So it's not that easy to collect and maybe that's why they didn't use it that much. The other thing is um, for, for charcoal, it's pretty easy to get it uh, because you set a fire and then you have you have your shackle. So I don't know exactly why they didn't use it. Um, but the thing is, if you want to use your shackle, then you yeah. will need to brush it very uh, finely. And if you tried to crush uh, your shackle very finely, you will realize that it will take you really, really a lot of time uh, to crush it finely to crush it fine enough uh, to be able to do a paint. So my to me is that it's easier to put something in like an ostrich shell or something like that or a big um, a big shell or something like that you put your um, your fat or your blood and you let it close to your fire and then you have something black that you can just crush just very quickly and then you have a paint so i think that's why they use that much those carbon black is it it's pretty easy to do it, actually. So <laughs> I think it is just lazy people. <laughs> no, I, I'm just kidding. But doing some experiments, it is what I arrived to this conclusion. It's maybe not what has been what has been the um, the reason. But to me, uh, when I experiment this, it's much easier to do carbon black than doing anything else. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I would like to add to Pumi's question and ask, where do you think the coloring materials used by San in their paintings come from? So, well, it, it depends on what type of coloring materials we are uh, talking about. Um, but usually um, what is um, the most important is to locate um, the geological uh, the geological sources. So mostly for the red and for the white. And in the case of uh, of the red, as I'm um, as I try to present, um, most of the red seems to come from really the same area as the site. So um, maybe one or maybe like. A few kilometers around, and if you go uh, close to the site, especially in Lesotho and uh, in the Maclear district, you will see that red earth is pretty much everywhere. So it's quite easy to collect. But uh, if we go more in the um, 19th and 20th uh, century testimonies uh, by um, uh, you know et ethnological testimonies, uh, then uh, they mention that the red should be collected from the basaltic part of the Drakensberg. So then we went there and uh, we collected some uh, some ochre from from there, and we. <laughs> I'm currently what, working on them, and definitely um, they have different signature, and especially they have a high quantity of magnesium, which is due to uh, augite, which is a, 
um, a minor role present uh, in Basalt. And uh, I I saw these minerals uh, previously on some uh, on some ochre, but I'm trying to uh, just be sure that I have all the information to prove that a part of the ochre come from this uh, area. But there is a lot of uh, uh, I'm almost done to prove it, <laughs> and that a few uh, that's uh, I would say a few of uh, what we what we sample come from it. And again, uh, about the white part, uh, the, the white uh, clay that were collected, again, most of them are really geologically um, close from, from the site, except for paraphyllite, uh, which uh, comes from, um, in, in fact, the closest, if I go to the here, uh, the closest, so here is the laser two, and this is where we found a uh, paraphyllite, and the closest geological source is actually here. So it's uh, it's about 500 kilometers far, and uh, there are other, there are also sources uh, here, and there is another one here. So we are trying to investigate uh, where exactly, it, from which uh, source it's, it, it comes from exactly. Okay, now I was just thinking that everything's just mineral because um, it's it's very weird because back in India, it's um, people use natural dye, and here they use mineral. So I'm I'm just very curious to understand why why is the community not using natural resources and I mean then sticking to minerals to paint, or is it from I don't know, is the rock causing that change? Uh, no, in fact, if you look at rock art in India, uh, they use only minerals to do their rock art. There, you okay. have only for recent time that they started to use dyes, uh, mm -hmm. but in that case, your dyes, you need to add um, alum salt or some kind of salt to make it precipitate and be able to use it. Um, this type of... Um, um, and this type of uh, technology, I would say, um, this it was not known for what we know for hunter gatherer here in in Southern Africa. And the other thing is, um, in India, you have a lot of plants uh, plants that uh, can be used to dye. Here in Southern Africa, you have some, but. Um, the thing is, uh, it would be much more difficult to extract and then to put uh, as paint rather than um, rather than just collect something that is present all over. Like you have red and white pretty much all all around you. It's easier to collect and just uh, refine it a bit and do do a paint with that uh, rather than collect a paint, extract the dye, and then precipitate it with salt and then turn it into paint. It's much, much longer. Um, so I assume it's because of that, that they that they didn't use it. But another thing that uh, I forget to mention is that um, if you <clears throat> if you use this kind of precipitate dye that we call a lake, um, in fact, it's a very uh, it's very light sensitive meaning that uh, it won't resist also if they use that i doubt that it would have resist uh, the climate and the exposition to sunlight in the the rock shelter when the paint are uh, are made okay okay um <laughs> any more questions anybody i'm sorry about that the door just banged but any more questions, Sebastian Tatenda? Um, I don't really have a question, just more of a comment um, that I think it's you know very interesting, I think, for most students who come from universities that don't focus on uh, rock art to hear more about what they do. Because, I mean, as we discussed earlier, there's a lot of you know photography and tracing, but to actually hear sort of a you know, the analysis of the actual paint, um, you know, it's a much more of a deep dive into the art itself beyond maybe just ethnographic study, I think is quite interesting. And um, I think we should hope that uh, there will be a 
a large growth you know, in this field specifically um, is maybe to answer the questions we haven't been able to answer in the last few decades at least. Thank you. Yeah, I really hope that uh, we will be able to develop that and do much, much more uh, in in the few coming years. Uh, just uh, if more students are interested in doing this, uh, just uh, call David Pierce and or call me, and uh, we we have a lot of work for you. <laughs> I think it would just be great to do like a comparative study of various nations that have rock art. Yes, well, actually I'm working here also in Canada and uh, I can tell you that uh, the, well, we can use pretty much the same protocol, but for now we can't date because we have only red ochre, but um, really their red ochre is really, really different from the one that you can find in Southern Africa. And the thing is, a few of their ochre is not geological, but it's biological uh, made. So it's bacteria that make the ochre uh, from the end of spring until the beginning of fall, and then you can collect them uh, on the river. So it's, it's really, really, really different, but uh, it's really interesting to see how those, pers the, those uh, populations so far uh, were able to uh, collect ochre and uh, make their paint out of, uh, this, um, out of this similar, um, I'm sorry, um, this uh, similar coloring materials, but coming from really different origin. Yeah, because I just think that as I mean, with the increase in global warming, I don't know how far the rock art will sustain in rock shelters. So it, as I mean, the more you document, the better is what I personally think. Indeed, and as you mentioned, you know, in India is one of the the worst parts for for rock art. Uh, we, I know that the researcher estimated that, uh, you know, they lost uh, a lot, a lot of sites. M maybe about. I, I just read an article when they estimate that they lost between ten and fifty sites every year. So, I'm just like, oh my god, <laughs> it's. Uh, it's really <laughs> awful, especially painted sites, because uh, that's the one, you know, engraving yeah. are uh, much resistance, but uh, painting painted sites, um, they they really don't like uh, humidity and rains and, and so on. Yeah, uh, and it's also, I feel like population, <laughs> population and the need for development is just mind blowing. <laughs> Yes, also, as as I mentioned uh, here with the construction of the two dams, uh, it's about um, 50 sites that are now underwater and you can consider it. You can consider that they are destroyed now because I doubt that the painting uh, will resist will resist that. So. Yeah, but you know, what's the other thing that I find fascinating is that um, in Drakensberg, I read a paper um, written by Duell and Smith. I think it's either in 2019 or 20. I'm not sure about the date where she mentioned that in Drakensberg, there are paintings behind waterfalls and they haven't been damaged at all. And now with a lot of development, I, I just feel like natural threat is there's a fine line to it when it actually becomes destruction and when it's not destruction mm -hmm. because when i read that paper i was very fascinated on how she described it and she said the painting right behind the fall like you can see the painting when there's not a lot of force in the water and it's very clear there's no damage to it and because there's not a, there's no graffiti on the painting it's very clear mm -hmm. and then of course, flooding and any other sources of water interaction with the paint just destroys it. It's just crazy how that happens. Yeah, but, uh, as you mentioned, you know, um, all sites is uh, has a specificity. It means that maybe some sites uh, will resist, um, 
you know, under a waterfall, etc. And especially under a waterfall, you don't have, you know, all the aquatic life that will come, like fishes and algae and so on that may destroy the paint. And if you have, you know, a specific environment with the good, uh, good <laughs> lichens and bacteria, they will protect the painting rather than uh, damage it. But on the other hand, you can be behind another waterfall on another substrate and it would be another, um, for example, uh, another coloring materials that had been that has been used. And here you will have a specific um, chemical reaction and then here the sites will be destroyed. So it is really sites uh, depending. And also uh, what I saw is that the, you know, the conservation of uh, one site, even different panels inside of one single site can be different uh, depending on uh, their orientation and um, you know the the size the the shape of the rock shelter in this part and so on and so on. So it is uh, it's really difficult to give uh, very like um, lines that okay if you if you find this and this condition then your site will be saved uh, it is pretty much impossible to do that so it's it's a shame but <laughs> that would be great if we can do that <laughs> <laughs> um any more questions okay if not i just have one last question before we wrap the session up. Um, I wanted to know what are the future developments of the project that we just had the presentation of? Uh, yeah, so what we are working at this moment is um, improving uh, the protocol for radiocarbon dating. So as I mentioned, we still need to sample uh, about two centimeters square to get a date. So we will try to reduce as much as possible uh, this um, uh, this size, so we would like to go to down to one centimeter square. So for this, we are investigating different type of uh, extraction of uh, of the carbon from the paint, especially plasma. And the other thing is um, trying to uh, understand how the the clay and all the all the coloring material were processed. Uh, before doing the paint. So for example, for the carbon blocks, what was burned and what type of temperature for how long uh, uh, we need to uh, we need to we need to reach what type of temperature and for how long to get a good carbon black and if we are able to uh, relate the microstructure of the paint to those reference samples that uh, that we will do. Um, the other thing is trying to understand also how the, the geological um, mineral resources were processed because, for example, when you get uh, red ochre or kaolinite or something like that, you can't use it like right like that <laughs> um you need to crush it or maybe you need you know you need to clean it because you always have you know some vegetables and uh, uh, not vegetable vegetables and plants sorry uh in it and and so on um so all of these steps uh can we um we, we try to see if they leave any kind of uh, uh, chemical uh marks inside of the structure of um of the coloring materials and then uh, if we can relate that uh, to the paint and say okay so they did this and this and this to do the paint and not only okay this is the coloring materials but between the coloring materials and the paint we don't know what happened we so there is a lot of uh, experimental archaeology going on in my lab at this moment <laughs> and we are burning very strange things and it doesn't smell good actually <laughs> But it is fine. <laughs> OK, I hope all the foul smell earns to fruitful outcomes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so with that, we've come to the end of this Arche Unlocking Archaeology episode, and I really hope all of you watching really enjoyed this. We had a lot of fun hosting Dr. Adafine Bonu with us. Um, and all I would like to say is thank you so much for watching and have a wonderful day ahead.
you can stop thank recording. you all right thank you uh, we'll thank you for the presentation Adolphine.